Welcome to worship here with Lord of Life. Uh, wherever you find yourself, it's so great that we can be together today. I'm Pastor Joel, and it's my pleasure to welcome you into this experience of, of worship as uh, today we shine by giving. I want to thank my ministry partners, Pastor Peter, David Frank, Brian Schrader, Fred Lillibo, and David Olson for uh, working together to bring this to you today. And, and thanks especially to you for bringing your presence, your voice, your prayers, uh, and your support into this experience of community today. As we start, just a couple quick uh, words to note about some important things that are coming up in our life as a congregation. On Sunday, August 23rd, we'll have another outdoor worship event. So Sunday, August 23rd at 9 and 10.30 a.m. We'll be out on the, the uh, south parking lot again. Uh, you can bring your own chair. Uh, we'll have drive-in worship, uh, but please go to lordoflife.org to register uh, as space is limited for that event. Also on the 23rd, we'll be collecting items uh, for many of our ministry partners, Gethsemane Lutheran Cross, and Freedom Works. Our website again has more information about just what is being collected on the 23rd. Reminder, Monday evenings, uh, until it gets too cold, we'll have worship in the backyard at seven o'clock. Bring your own chair and again, register at lordoflife.org. And also that's the place to go, our website, to start registering for our fall children, youth, and family ministry opportunities, church school, confirmation, high school opportunities, Everything you need to know is right there on the website. We're here to worship, though, so we begin with a song. Hello, everyone. Let's sing. Let the king of my heart the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, this is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the rescue for my life, oh, this is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, this is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, this is my song. You are good, good. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And together, let's pray. God of grace and goodness, you come to us today through this experience. 
Help us embrace your presence among us and see that you are good, that you give us absolutely everything that we need, and that we can hold on to the truth that, that you always provide enough. Help us to see what we have and what we can do and what we can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this summer we have been exploring how we can let our light shine. Not so much how we turn on a light switch or a flashlight and let that light shine, but how we let our light shine by being who God wants us to be and how we're called to be. We can let our light shine in so many ways, like being thankful for all that God's given us, caring for others, using our talents and skills for good. And another way that we let our light shine is by giving in the Bible God's story and your story. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided to give in your heart, not unwillingly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. Can you think of anyone who is a cheerful giver? I can think of somebody. He gave food to the hungry. He gave friendship to those who were lonely. He showed us how to give to those who didn't have very much. Do you have an idea who I'm talking about? He's in the Bible. Jesus. Jesus was a cheerful giver and showed us how we can be cheerful givers too. When we are cheerful givers, we're showing God's love. So how can we be cheerful givers this week? Maybe we can give to the hungry, look through your food cabinet and give to those who don't have enough food. Maybe we can make friends with the lonely. Maybe think of somebody you haven't talked to in a while, draw them a picture and send it in the mail or call them up on the phone. Maybe we can give to those in need. Clean out your toys, the ones that you don't use it very often, or empty that piggy bank of yours and give to those who are in need. These are all ways that we can be cheerful givers. These are ways that we can make our heart happy, fill other people's heart with happiness, and make God happy. When you're giving, you're letting your light shine. So let's pray. This is a wiggly prayer, so can you stand up and do the actions with me? Jesus showed us his love by giving. I love him, so I'll give to two hands God gave me for helping me and you. Thank you, God, for all the good we can do. Amen. My name is Lauren Raker, and today's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the gospel of the Lord.
One of the uh, most interesting aspects of the history of the Christian church is how it grew so exponentially in the centuries that followed Jesus' time on earth. Uh, immediately after the resurrection, in approximately 30 AD, there were at most a couple of hundred Christians. H historian Rodney Stark reports that by uh, 100 AD, about 70 years later, that number had, had only grown to about 7,500. But by 325 AD, estimates say that there were 27 million who professed the Christian faith. What happened? How, how did Christianity spread? Well, the Holy Spirit, uh, of course, blew across the Roman Empire and, and changed people's hearts. But there was a, another important factor in the growth of the church. Well, when the church becomes what it is meant to be, there's a, a, a magnetism and a beauty about people's lives. Christians then have a, a, a lifestyle that attracts people to the church. From the outside, non-Christians look at the lives of Christians and they say, I want some of that. In approximately 115 AD, a famous Christian document was written. It's called the uh, Epistle of Mathetus to Diognetus. Now, we're, we're not really sure uh, about who the author or recipient are, but it's believed that, that Diognetus was a non-Christian and that Mathetus wrote him a letter about, about Christianity, explaining it and explaining why the church was growing so fast. And, and, and it's a very interesting letter. Let me, let me read four excerpts. The first, Christians busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They live in their own native lands, but they live as aliens. For every foreign country is as their native land, and every native land is as their foreign country. A second, they marry and have children, but they do not kill unwanted babies. Third, they share their table with everyone, but they don't share their bed with everyone. And finally, though poor, they make people rich. Though short of everything, they have plenty of everything. Now those were four important characteristics of the early church. And, and, and the first one really is about an absence of racism. Foreign countries were as their native land and their native lands were as their foreign countries. The, the early church was, was, was made up of, of Palestinians, Africans, Greeks, and Romans. But they were Christians first and Palestinians, Africans, Greeks, and Romans second. Making race and nationality a secondary issue had never happened before in most of the world, and including ours, it doesn't really happen today. But the early Christians remembered that Jesus made the Samaritan, the foreigner, the hero of his parable. They remembered that Paul wrote in Galatians 3.28, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. So, so Christians no longer took their identity from where they were born and, and the color of their skin. And it cut racism in the early church down to its root. The, the absence of racism, especially as seen by those who were being discriminated against, attracted people to the church. Uh, secondly, Christians had a, had a high, high view of life. The letter said they do not kill unwanted babies. Now, 2,000 years ago, parents had a right to, to dispose, dispose of a child that they didn't want. Christians, though, saw that every life, no matter how unwanted, was, 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 was absolutely inviolable and infinitely Precious. 
It was the, the, the Christian church that first organized orphanages for children who had nowhere to live. That, that view of life was revolutionary, and it actually attracted people to the church. Uh, thirdly, Christians had uh, what for its time was an unusual view of sex. Now, the, the societal view of sex was that it was an appetite. If you were hungry, you ate, and if you felt like sex, you had sex. The letter to Diognetus points out that these Christians don't share their bed with everyone. Christians believe that, that sex was God's appointed way to say to another human being that I belong completely and exclusively and permanently to you. Now, what's interesting is that these, these early Christians had, had been raised in a pagan sex ethic where, but when they became Christians, they felt liberated. They, they, they find intimacy, they find healing, they find security in Christian marriage. The, the Christian lifestyle attracted people to the church. Uh, finally, these early Christians were known for eye-popping generosity. Uh, the letter read, they, they share their table with everyone. Though poor, they make many rich. Christians were, were radically generous. They, they fed those who were hungry, housed those who needed housing, and clothed those without clothes. They, they, they did this even for people that they didn't know. And, and the world had seen nothing like that. And, and, and when others saw that generosity, they, they, they were attracted to it. The church grew. Here's another example of it. Historian Stark writes about how in, in, in 165 A.D. and then in 251 A.D., there were major epidemics in the Roman Empire that that killed up to one-third of the population. Well, we know something now about pandemics, don't we? Now, in, in, in that world, the thought that predominated was it's every person for themselves. People would, would, would literally abandon spouses and children and parents and, 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 and friends. They'd, while still alive, they would dump these people out beyond the city walls in order to avert disease themselves. But then there's this little community that remembered how Jesus cared for the sick. They said, we follow one who would, who, who would touch lepers when no one else would. And, and, and so they would take people in, they would care for the sick and the dying, even sometimes at the cost of their own lives even for people who were not part of their community. From, from, from our gospel reading today, they, they, they didn't only love those who loved them. They weren't only good to those who were good to them. They, they didn't only lend to those from whom they expected to receive. They did good, these early Christians, expecting nothing in return. And people noticed the attractiveness of their lives. A lack of racism, a high regard for human life, a, a, a sexual ethic of, of purity and commitment, and radical generosity even to people they didn't know. Now, through the 20 centuries since then, um, there's been an ebb and a flow to Christianity and how it's reflected those traits, and the truth is, the letter to Diognetus might have been a bit exaggerated. But here's the question for us today. What is the Christian church known for in our culture? Well, what would a, a, a modern-day seeker like Diognetus see? Well, it's not the whole story, but what is often noticed is how the church becomes isolated and, 
and how it focuses on differences among people instead of similarities. In the last century in Minnesota, that meant that, meant that small towns needed three Lutheran churches, one Swedish, one Norwegian, one German. And that's actually, that's actually nothing compared to how American churches have handled issues around race. A racism that was ubiquitous in the culture was treated in churches with, with indifference or, or, or seen sometimes as an issue too touchy to address. How does that feel now? And, 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 and it's true, stories appear regularly in the media about, about how children were not, were not always protected in churches and how, and how abuse was covered up. How does that look to the world? And, and often, when, when pastors show up in the news, it is, it is having to do with the crossing of some sexual boundaries, or, or pastors are, are shown on internet memes living in these humongous homes on lavish estates, flying in, in, in private jets. How's that viewed when it comes to generosity towards others? Now, I do not think any of that is the whole story. But at the same time, it's not untrue. And it's resulted in a a cynicism towards towards churches and towards Christians among our culture. People, People don't like what they see. And while Lord of Life does not reflect this trend, the, 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 the Christian church in the United States re- reflects how it is viewed and is in a pretty steady decline. So what do we do? What does Lord of Life do? Well, let me suggest four things. We, we undertake unceasing efforts to combat the racism that is pervasive in our country. And and I sense a real determination among among our leaders and members at Lord of Life to finally be diligent in our efforts toward racial justice and reconciliation. Secondly, we need to keep our kids safe. And, And let me just here say our kids and our elderly especially in this time that we are living that causes great risks to their health. Thirdly, I suggest we keep se- sexual ethics an important value in the midst of a culture where that is seemingly in decline. Karen and I have missed out on a number of uh, 50 year wedding anniversaries and even one 60 year anniversary celebration during this pandemic. These These old folks in our church should be our models for commitment. And fourth, let us show radical generosity toward those in need. Now, a Lord of Life is actually pretty good at this. The the, the I Can Help campaign that we have undertaken, it's been amazing. In 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 the wake of the worst health crisis in a century, with with the economy slowing and the the future uncertain, people have given a lot of money to those in need. And and here's another example of generosity. The the Lord of Life Community Garden designates um, half of the land uh, in the garden um, towards raising produce that is given away. Now, Usually, most of that goes to the food shelves at Cross. Real important to have fresh produce there. But, but, but this year, we had such a bumper crop that there is, there's more than Cross can even handle. So, so three times this week, I delivered uh, six boxes of tomatoes and bins of corn, cabbage, beans, zucchini, cucumbers, and peppers to Gethsemane Lutheran Church in North Minneapolis. 
Now, the, the first time I went down there, uh, the woman who, who runs the few food distribution each day, um, she was amazed at the size of the zucchini. In fact, she took one home. The second time, though, I went there and she asked, does all of this really come from Lord of Life's garden? And the third time she said to me, that must be some garden. And the truth is, it is. But here's what happened. She noticed the generosity. The absence of racism, the care of children, moral values, radical generosity. When, when the church becomes what it's meant to be, there's a, a magnetism and beauty about people's lives. For 2,000 years, it has been a lifestyle that has attracted people to the church. From the outside, non-Christians look at the lives of these Christians and they say, I want some of that. That's what happens when we shine by giving. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Let's sing. For the honor of our maker who reaches out to us that we might live inside God's love. You sent your only son for the honor of the Savior, let the cross be lifted high. The great exchange of love and grace came down to give us life. Oh, oh. As we embrace your love for the honor of your kingdom whose reign will never end we'll give our lives in sacrifice until you come We'll give 
our lives in sacrifice until you come again. I'm out here at the Lord of Life Community Garden and it has been a bumper crop this season, a sign of, of God's abundance, of God's provision, and a sign that, uh, that life is here. And so uh, I invite you as we are gathered here uh, to, to pray with me, and we pray for the church, for the world, and for all who are in need. Loving God, you call the church to love as we have been loved. Bless as we have been blessed. Give as we have been given. Help us to see the gifts that you bestow and to realize that there is more than enough to go around. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have entrusted us with the wonders of creation. Grant your grace to flow through the air and wade across the waters. Provide safety and refuge for all creatures. Let this earth that we share sing your praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call the nations to offer structures that help the common good. Inspire each of us to look beyond our individual gain, comfort, and fear. Guide leaders to seek justice and equality for all and to do the hard work that comes when there are competing interests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. Grace teachers and all who work in education with your abiding presence these days. Give courage to all who must make difficult and even unpopular decisions. We pray for those who do not have enough, for those who are filled with fear, for those who need your healing, and for those who are grieving this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal and strengthen us for life in your name. We celebrate with the newly married Elizabeth and Mitch and Carly and Alec. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Whew, that was a mad dash back from the garden but we're here for the Thanksgiving moment. I want you to know that because of your generous support, Lord of Life has been able to safely and creatively expand our outside worship opportunities this summer. This past Monday, we had our first outdoor backyard worship experience, and these will continue through the fall every Monday at 7 p.m., weather permitting. There will be worship and Holy Communion out on the backyard. Just register and bring your own share. Thank you for making this possible. The offering will now be received, and you can give in any of the ways that are noted on the screen. Again, thank you. Raise. 
As you move forward from this worship experience, you don't go alone. This community is a part of what is going with you, this experience, and then also, most importantly, God's peace goes with you as well. And so, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And take a moment, too, to share a sign of God's peace with those who are around you, either physically present or even those who you know you'll come into contact with this week. And now as we go forward, we do so knowing that we are children of God, loved beyond measure, sent to serve the world. <laughs>